river's inspired everything, really, in, in, in a way. I think it, I think it adds, adds a fluid to, to everything that I work on. There's no sense of permanence. And I think that's, uh, that's very much, that, that I find very interesting because it's, everything is about process. It's not about building things that are fixed. I mean, there's anchor points. If you like, there's, there's, there's certain things that are fixed, but within that, many, many things can change all the time, and I quite like that. How did all this begin? Um, an accident, like uh, most things. I was in, the um, first big exhibition I did was in Dusseldorf in 1980 and um, when I came back from London it was the first time I had any uh, cash to spend I suppose and I saw an advert for a boat and I bought a barge and at the time I'd always liked the water I'd always been around the water as, as a kid my grandfather used to work around here so I used to come down here as a boy so I knew what was here I knew I knew where the river what was on the river bank um, it was fairly derelict in those days. It wasn't this uh, extremely swish area that it is now. The key word is access. I mean, there's something like um, 18,000 square foot of space on these barges. They're not small. Um, I'm very interested in this idea of how you set up a series of adventures as you go round. I think the most extraordinary thing is the complete indifference uh, from the uh, big commercial operations alongside who totally ignored the, the long-standing rights the fact that boats have been here for um, at least 350 years. And then Norman Foster arrived. The Foster Global Corporation, which is the best way to describe them because that's what Foster and Partners are. And I think we should stop referring to an architect. This is, in fact, a global corporation. Uh, Foster and Partners in the Times showed a photograph of the redevelopment that was coming here with us airbrushed out and that was very strange to see yourself airbrushed out of existence. There's other things that are that have grown out of just the love of being here which is an increasing I think it started in the in the 80s when the river cleaned up a lot of the industries closed um, the, the wildlife on the river just exploded and we're just surrounded by all kinds of different bird life and one of the things that's been great fun over the years has been the enormous amount of nests that are built on rafts around the site and I'd like to set that up in a, with some more facilities for that and put in some facilities for some habitats for the bird life. It's a bit like uh, having children sometimes, artworks. They, they kind of take over, and they need more space. The artworks that are in here um, all have quite bizarre beginnings, a lot of them very accidental. I've been a great believer in um, art is what happens to you. The most you can do is reflect what happens to yourself, which if you're lucky becomes a metaphor for the broader condition of the times we live in. I think in the mid 80s I started to become more politicized as an artist, which uh, I wouldn't say that I set out to be. It was just that things kept happening to me. It's partly being on the river 
And I think many of the artworks have come about in that way, but always with this sort of reference of being an outsider on a boat, uh, which is a very useful one to have because you, I think when you're making art, you want to be a spectator. And it's very hard to be a spectator when you're in it, when you step off the shore and you come onto the river and you're subjected to the tides. Um, which is fundamentally what the moon is doing up there, the gravitational pull of the moon. You're in a different world completely, and I think that gives rise to a lot of good things, which is the ability to see things from a distance, but also a kind of dreamscape. I used to take the, uh, the motor barge down to the East Coast every summer for a few years, and I used to spend sometimes two or three months of the year down there. And that's when I started making all these chart pieces, which were very much the opposite to uh, the more political pieces. It was just very spontaneous reactions to, to just places that I, I was at. For example, the one just behind me, which was uh, a navigation chart, a fictional navigation chart. This one, which was uh, another piece that came out of uh, just some thoughts about things that I'd done in South America. I wasn't brought up as a steel worker, but it was another one of those things where it just being on a boat becomes part of your life. And in two of these barges, this one and the one next door, there's a number of hanging pieces, um, which really just came out of, by accident, things that I spotted that interested me, that I collected over the years, um, such as the big hook there, which is that's the main lifting hook from Battersea Power Station. Um, and next door, there's a huge amount of objects, most of which I actually used to use. And then I just decided I'll leave them because they they kind of arrange themselves into a into a, an accidental archive, and the fact that they sit there with their own life and move when the tide's up. quite like this idea that you're not in control. There's something much bigger, which is, which is called chance. And I think letting that work enables you to keep rediscovering yourself. Shrinking Beach piece, even though it touched on a lot of other issues such as um, land use around the world um, and very political things that are happening such as in South America. It focused very much on this, this general sense of respect for things that are common to all of us. So the idea of taking a, a general who was also a very large landowner, the Bishop of Southwark, the Secretary General of Amnesty, politician, journalists, human rights activists, a Buddhist monk, all of these people who in many ways represented land institutions who were in many ways antagonistic to one another. The idea was to take them away from their institutions where they have their natural tendencies and to see what they could agree on. And the idea of timing it so that they are giving them Wellington boots, and timing it so that the tide would rise around the table as they were speaking was, was one a metaphor of things that are bigger than us, nature, the march of history. It was quite interesting to see how it kind of humbled everybody into being able to come to a consensus. I called it first art because it's where we come from. It's what comes first. It's in us. I think uh, Picasso and Matisse all recognise that the sources in us, we don't have to go off necessarily to another continent to find it. Being in these spaces
spaces, you've got access to the ideas of geography, construction, geometry, mathematics, materials, the moon, the stars. There's an awful lot of things down here which um, children in the city are not used to seeing. The quality of the work was, was just astonishing to me. I'd never seen such great work being produced so easily. Um, I've seen people at art school spending years trying to work with such speed and agility and flair and humour. But kids just do it very naturally. Because you can't teach art, all you can do is inspire art. The knack has been just to catch them in the right way. You give them a sketch pad and some crayons and they go mad down here. You then give them a nice set of canvases, beautiful canvases and a beautiful set of paints, which makes them feel really important. They go mad and the result is just some fabulous work. So we're incredibly busy down here. I think what's very interesting to me is that uh, it works so successfully. I don't know whether it's, it's, it's because people are trying to get out of the city and happy to be down on the river or whether it's because they're, they're involved in something which may benefit their kids in the local schools. Any which way, it's extremely successful and the, and the morale is very good and we're, we're, we're moving forward very fast. Yeah.